Peter Holly Austin. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So glad that you are here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about developing a comic book collection, and this is a great way to start introducing comics into your curriculum. Um, if you are a little hesitant um, uh, to bring them into your curriculum, having a comic book collection is a great way to get them into your classroom, and these are fabulous educational tools. Um, before we get started, uh, letting uh, our panelists introduce themselves. I'm going to tell you a little bit about CBLDF and what we do. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment rights of the comics art forum and its community of retailers, creators, publishers, librarians, and readers. The CB CBLDF provides legal referrals, representation, advice, assistance, and education in furtherance of these goals. And we are a small nonprofit organization. We're directly supported by contributions from our members and donors. If you can make a donation or a contribution, please do so, and you can find out how to do that from our website. Um, also, before we get started, let you know that um, we will be posting things in chat. Uh, we have a Q&A um, option as well. You can um, type those in whenever you get ready, and we will address those questions at the end um, of the webinar. So without any further ado, I will let our panelists introduce themselves, starting with Nora. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Nora Flanagan. I teach English in the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, this is going to be my 22nd year. And I've been teaching comics in the classroom since around 2001, 2002. Um, I think I started with Persepolis uh, right around when the first volume came out. Um, and it had such resonance with my students, especially um, students of marginalized groups, students of color, that I started incorporating more comics, uh, especially representation comics and identity comics, um, but a bit of everything to the point where I designed an elective class that begins with a 10 week close study of comics, um, form content and a good range. So now that elective is in its seventh or eighth year uh, and it's now available to every high school in the Chicago Public Schools. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> for sure. Oh, so I guess I mean, uh, so hi, uh, thanks for inviting me to participate. My name's Michael Gian Francisco. Uh, I'm a high school teacher in uh, North Providence, Rhode Island. I also adjunct um, at Johnson Wales University in Providence. Um, I've been teaching for 15 years and I've been using comics in the classroom since student teaching days. Um, Persepolis and Mouse were two of my first uh, couple of books to introduce, but since then I've, um, I've taught a bunch of different books. I have a lot of different um, class sets that I use and I've been building my classroom library for about, uh, well, I've been building it since I started teaching, but it's been available to students and teachers for the last three years. Um, so um, that's it. I've, I've, I do a lot of panels. I presented at Brown University, Harvard University, Fordham uh, University, uh, Leslie University, New York Comic Con, San Diego, C2E2, ALA, NCTE, and I've been humping it out there trying to get the word on using comics in the classroom for a long, long time. So, thanks. Thank you. Glad you're here. Uh, so I guess it's my turn now. Yes. Um, I'm Andrew Woodrow Butcher. I am not an educator. I am a comics retailer. So I um, work for a comic book shop in Toronto called The Big Island. And I also run their spin-off kids-only comic book shop called Little Island Comics. But the main thing I do with uh, my time is to uh, institutional sales to school and public libraries. Really, all I spend my days doing is talking to teachers and librarians about comics might be good options for their classes. Um, in addition to that, I work for the Toronto Comic Arts Festival, which happens every year in May, where I co-program our day of professional development for teachers and librarians. Um, so you should all check that out next May. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, those are the hats I wear. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate you being a part of this and supporting CBDF with your time and um, knowledge and information. I guess we'll get started. And to, to get started, um, I thought we would start off by talking about uh, why people would want to build a comics collection in their classroom. Um, what are the benefits of having a comics collection in the classroom? Oh, for my part, um, having it has been, um, 
it's been given me a lot of opportunities, particularly for self-selected reading assignments where students can choose um, books right out of the library uh, in order to read and they have options rather than me walking them to the school library um, and having them, um, you know, try to find something that they're not really that interested in there. Not that the school library is a bad place, it's a great place, um, but they have a limited collection um, of graphic novels. Um, so in addition to having all the comics in my classroom library, I have a lot of science fiction and fantasy books. I'm a big nerd and it ref it's reflected in the books I choose. Um, so having that resource is, is great for my classes, but in addition, when teachers outside of my class have students that want to do something um, with self-selected reading or comics, or they just have a kid that really wants to read and um, wants a comic, but they don't know, um, the teacher doesn't have as much familiarity, they can send them to me and the student can borrow from my library um, that way as well. I've also had a lot of teachers buy, borrow books for their kids to take home to their own children. Um, so um, just having that, that extra choice um, <laughs> And that extra resource in the building has been great, not just for my classes, but for my colleagues as well. I would, I would add to that, not only do I back up everything Michael just said, but I would add a dimension because I'm lucky to have, a, have worked with really receptive library staff over the years at my school. And so while I started with a classroom collection and, and was seeing all the same things that Michael was describing, I also was able to use the heavy traffic I was getting to my comics collection in the classroom as justification for why the library needed to open its own comics and graphic novels section. And then that kind of flowed back the other way too, where yeah, I'll say this on a webinar. I also tend to keep the comics and graphic novels that maybe they don't feel great about having in the library. The kids can come to my room for um, books like Bitch Planet and Black Hole and stuff that maybe we're not gonna put out front and center on the library shelves. So we've got kind of a good symbiotic relationship going between a classroom collection and a library collection. That's great. Uh, all of uh, what you folks have said totally rings true for, uh, for me as well. Um, I would also want to sort of just zoom out and say comics right now are where the action is. Um, the most popular books uh, for across age categories are often graphic novels nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't include comics, you are missing out uh, and your students are missing out. Um, so if you have a classroom library, if you have any kind of library, uh, I would say that comics need to be part of it right now. I agree, and our library staff um, has year after year shown us the data that that is the most heavily uh, trafficked section of our library, is the comics and graphic novels sec section. I've been working really, oh, I'm sorry, please. No, no, go ahead. I've been working really closely with our school librarian um, uh, over the last few years to help her um, generate more books in her library. In fact, if I, if I go to shows and I get a couple of copies of a book, um, I will donate one to her library as well. That way, you know, there's this cross pollination happening. And she comes to me every year with recommendations when she gets her annual budget. Like she puts aside X amount that she uses to buy graphic novels. And I, I give her my best recommendations based upon what she already has. Um, that's that relationship has been really good. Um, so far and, and we get along the library and I get along really well. So that helps too. Um, so yeah, there's, there's opportunity for collaboration um, across subject matter areas, you know, as well uh, through me bringing books that I either have, or as you said, Nora, the books that I have that she may not feel comfortable shelving. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I don't have as big of a problem with it, you know, because I'm curating it a little bit more specifically and I'm really familiar with what's in each of those texts. Um, although comics and graphic novels are, they're an incredible tool for engaging students uh, in the classroom. Could you talk a little bit about, about that and about how having um, a collection has helped you uh, engage students in, in coursework? educational benefits of them. Yeah, I, what, I, what I often will do is if we're doing a unit on the hero's journey, just to use a, an old standard, there are so many books that I can, I can put in as a front load for that, um, whether it's Spider-Man, you know, Miles Morales', Morales Spider-Man book, or, or something like, you know, one of Victoria Jameson's books, like, you know, like Roller Girl or All's Fair, 
and I can put I can put those books into the hands of kids based upon what I know about them to illustrate that idea of hero's journey that will front load knowledge for a standard text across the class. So if we then do the Odyssey or you know again I'm just using just the mm-hmm. basics you know simple terms Beowulf or you know something like that um, that they have oh that's just like what happened to Miles in this book or what happened to you know Ms. you know Ms. Marvel was another really good one New Normal the very frustrated Ms. Marvel you know that that happened to Kamala in this book um, and then you can draw those parallels and you can show them how the hero's journey will line up not just across the old dusty texts you know the books the teachers give them it lines up across you know, any types of texts, including, you know, comic books. I had not thought of using Roller Girl for Hero's Journey. And I'm saying that as a retired roller derby player, (laughs) (laughs) that book. And I have yet to hand it to a kid of any age, especially people familiar with the sport. Oh, okay. I'm stealing that, Michael. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) My pleasure. That's a very popular book. There's another one. I'm blanking on the name. Another roller derby book. And I can't remember. I think Boom produced it. And I can't I have remember. one that's a collection of roller derby stories. But I mean, that brings up to go back to the original question, you know, as far as the usefulness in the classroom, I have found that comics and graphic novels are a great way. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is going to sound so basic, but sometimes it's so simple. It's right in front of us um, of reaching the kids that there are a lot of books about. I mean, there were books about queer and trans kids in comic and graphic novel form way before I was seeing a lot of novels about them. And there was better representation in the Marvel universe than in the literary universe as a whole as high school kids were experiencing it. So Mm -hmm. my comics and graphic novel collection kind of became a stopping point for a lot of the kids that don't see themselves represented in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Don't maybe see themselves valued in school. Part of what I uh, was trying to say too about um, how comics are where the action is, not just like that's where the popular books are, there's a DIY ethos to the production of comic books that means that often they're on the edge of the things you now need in a contemporary library, you know? Exactly as you say. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, and I learn a lot from reading them, to Nora's point. Um, I, I learned so much about gender identity and sexual orientation from reading Liz Prince's Tomboy. Mm. Um, that really taught me I mean, just, it was my introduction to that world. And I, you know, I, I wasn't that I didn't believe in it. I just didn't understand a lot of it. And since then, uh, Gender Queer is another one that just dropped recently yes. that I read that has a ton of really solid information. Then there's a, there's like a mini comic about pronouns. Yes. Uh, uh, it's like a <laughs> short guy to they them pronouns. Yeah. It the short guy to they them pronouns. Oh, yeah. it's so good. It is. And those books... <laughs> I, I work with the school GSA and we do a graphic novel day where I bring in all of these books that um, either directly address um, those types of questions or they have characters in them um, that either, either it's part of the story and it's about that or it's, um, uh, is it like, is it Kiss Number 8 that I read recently? Yeah, by uh, Colleen Ayer. Yeah, she's yeah. amazing. She's a wonderful person. And that book was one of my best overall graphic novels of the year. And it has that piece to it as well. Um, so yeah, like I bring those books to the students and the you know, GSA is made up of straight and, and members of the LGBTQ community. And, you know, we invite other students and other teachers to come in and take a look at some of the books and that, you know, very often those books get taken for, you know, and, and handed around to each other for a while and that. I find that that's very, that illustrative version of it. It helped me understand it. And I think it helps other people as well. Um, Graphic novels, of course, are also great uh, for um, scaffolding and and other, um, and, you know, educational um, uses. Uh, What are the resources that you know that I, I will I will promote our resources. We have very many resources here at CBLDF. I will actually show you where you can find those. Actually, I pressed the wrong button. Let's see. Right here on our website, we have all kinds of um, 
all kinds of resources for you to help you get started developing a library collection, uh, classroom collection, and to help you defend those. Um, now let's see if I can stop sharing this. Technology is not always my, my strong suit, y'all. But we, we, we did it. <laughs> uh, so some, some things, panel power is a great tool. Raising a reader is another one that we have that is fantastic. And Comic Start Here, which um, is basically focused on, it's an introduction to graphic novels for librarians to, who are looking to start or expand um, a comic book collection. So we have those resources available to you. Please, um, please get those from our website. I would like for y'all to talk about maybe some resources or strategies um, that, that you know of to help educate other uh, other educators or anyone who might not understand the educational benefits of comics, what resources and strategies um, can you can folks use to educate? So I've put together a list um, that Holly has said she would be able to share with participants yes. of academic journals and um, sources that will impress administrators uh, who might be questioning your choice to include comics. And it includes stuff from Harvard and from uh, a couple other like university level sources uh, and Scholastic. Uh, and I subdivided it into grade school, high school and um, representation because I have found that when dealing with administrators and other folks above my pay grade that might not be on board with comics yet, the more outside source support you can give them, the better. Um, because maybe they don't want to listen to the teacher with tattoos on her hands, but they'll listen to Harper. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I wanted to promote uh, a friend of mine. Her daughter wrote a book uh, very recently, Meryl Jaffe and um, Talia Hurwitz just published. Uh, I'll put it in. Uh, can I put stuff in the chat? Too? Yes, you can. Okay. Please do. I'll put a link to it. It's called Worth a Thousand Words. Um, uh, using graphic novels to teach visual and verbal literacy. This is one of the newest uh, books and, and Meryl and her daughter are, uh, Meryl, I should just say Meryl and Talia are two of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Um, and they put their heads together to build out this um, very um, versatile uh, tool for educators to, if you've never used graphic novels, it's really good if you've never used them. It's also pretty good if you already have. Um, uh, I would also, um, I would also point to um, uh, uh, his, at History Comics, uh, that's Tim Smythe. He is a history teacher and does a ton, yeah, on Twitter he's at History Comics. Um, he does a ton of work with teaching with comics and he posts a lot of stuff on his website and his, his Twitter, go to his Twitter, um, his, um, that'll lead to his website. And also um, Eric Callenborn, who's gonna be doing a webinar with you folks next month on teaching with comics uh, is the other comic book teacher.com. And he has tons of stuff. He last year, he, he wrote a review every day of a graphic novel that went into his comic book library every day, 365 reviews in 365 days. Um, and he did it. <laughs> so it's all on his website still. It's all free. All that stuff is free. So um, I would definitely encourage you to look at the, at all of that stuff too. Uh, I would uh, add to all of those resources, uh, getting out into your community and seeing what kind of partners there are who can either provide great ammunition or even just re like information um, or experiences for students. Um, so for example, I'm a retailer uh, who specializes in comics in classrooms. Not every comic shop um, has done a lot of work with classrooms, but many around the country have. Um, public libraries uh, are great resources where there are often librarians who are like passionate about this medium and can help out. But also uh, comics festivals and comic cons often run professional development streams of programs ex expressly for teachers and librarians uh, to develop their skills, to get oriented inside the medium. Um, and I would totally uh, look, at, look to your local uh, comics events and see if they're already offering um, some professional development around comics. Yeah, my um, cohort, um, LitX, L-I-T-X, um, is we do a lot of panel programming for, um, for Comic-Cons and um, professional um, 
as I said before, like professional organizations like NCTE and ALA. ALA has a graphic novel comics roundtable, um, which whether you're a librarian or a teacher, it's worth joining, um, joining ALA and joining the graphic novel comics roundtable because they, um, they talk comics and titles and uses, you know, application across the board all the time. Um, but if you go to New York Comic Con, they have library programming on the first day of the show, which I believe is Thursday. Um, see, if you're in Seattle, uh, um, uh, Emerald City. Emerald City has it on the Friday at the library. Um, C2E2 still houses all their educational stuff on the Friday in at the um, at McCormick Place because it's such a big venue. Um, San Diego Comic Con does a full day of programming that you don't even have to have a badge to get into. Um, on Wednesday and Thursday, I believe, there's librarian and, te and teacher programming there. Um, and what am I missing? Denver Comic Con, which does a ton of programming, uh, mostly on the first day of the show, but usually it's spread out over the whole weekend. Very educationally or oriented show as well. So there's tons. Um, in every local Comic Con usually has at least a couple of panels and workshops available. But the big ones, if you can get to them, definitely do. Awesome. I would like to add um, to Andrew's point of reaching out to retailers. We um, we actually do a webinar that trains retailers, and we have that list of, of trained retailers um, on our website. I will include that uh, when I at all of the attendees. You will get an email from me next week with Nora's list of resources, a list of. Um, that Andrew provided of uh, where to get started on developing a library. It'll also include <clears throat> the list of retailers that have uh, been trained to work with libraries and schools. And if your comic book store is not on that list, then go to your comic book store and tell them that they should take this training <laughs> because you want to work with them. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that. Um, let's move on and talk about possibly where one begins with starting a, a classroom collection and where, where did y'all start when you began? What, what made you want to start and, and how did you get started with building your collection? Before that though, I'm going to actually uh, embarrass Michael for a second and show um, this problem. He has, he has a, he has a lot of, he has a lot of comic books. And then how many do you have to shelf before you start to school this year? <laughs> uh, about 75 more books yeah. to put into that. And like I said, I have three long boxes filled with graphic novels that I have to read and I have to curate them before I put them in. So there's a lot. <laughs> That's just in school. That's not my collection at home too. I have about the same amount here in boxes and in shelves. So how did y'all get started? <laughs> like Michael I started bringing my own to school I don't have nearly that kind of collection because I grew up in a house with um, comics readers um, both of my brothers uh, but I wasn't myself a huge comics reader really until I was an adult um, and started teaching them and started getting out to comic shops more often I had a few favorites from when I was a kid that my brothers had given me like um, the Sandman series and the death books and, and a couple others like that. Cause I was a goth kid. Um, but my collection grew really slowly and I just would start bringing stuff I had read and really liked. And I thought students might like to school. And so it, very, very slowly. And then, um, I mean, a plug for comic shops again, the more I started going out to my local comic shops, the more I found for myself and my students. And so like our collections, my home collection and my school collection, kind of grew concurrently and there's a lot of cross-pollination and I looked before we got online and I thought man almost all my books are at school now so that's fine. That's good though. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I, had, yeah, I started with some of my own but I had a real hard time like loaning my copies to students um, because I, I, I like them <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I started to, to get duplicate copies and buying second copies if I could find them cheap enough or, um, you know, whatever, so I could take them home and not have to worry. So there are some uh, that I have multiples of that I keep here and there. Not that many, to be honest with you. A lot of the books that are in my classroom library, that's their, the only copy that I have. Um, and I, like I got started when I started collecting. I started collecting when I was a teenager and um, 
so, you know, I, I got older, I sold my collection like we, you do in your 20s because you think you don't need it anymore and then you wish you hadn't when you're in your 30s. Um, so I started collecting trades, you know, to, to get those issues that I missed because I used to collect floppies um, issue by issue. Um, but when I started teaching, um, I started just kind of bringing them in and giving them to students and I said, well, this is really hard because I'm constantly digging for them in my shelves, trying to give them to them and then hopefully they're going to come back to me. So, you know, I started a club called the Nerd Herd, um, which is kids that love, that's after school, it's kids that love all sorts of fandom. And we started raising money to buy books for the classroom library. Um, so we would do fundraising events, selling cookies or whatever, you know, whatever stuff we could think about, you know, t-shirts and stuff. And that money would go into, you know, having little pizza parties from time to time and also purchasing more books to the library. Um, so as I started to build the library and I started to get more active in, at the shows, um, I discovered that um, publishers who, if you are willing to give them something back in that, in that sense, it's like, I'm going to make sure this book gets into the hands of a student, or I'm going to encourage this teacher to buy a class set. Very often, you know, they'll, they'll give you a copy of something, or you can go to NALA or an NCTE and they'll give you galleys, um, which are not ready for publication, but are complete versions of the books. And um, I started collecting those and putting them in the library as promised and, and talking them up. Um, so, you know, and then I would go to, I would go to comic book stores because every now and then they would have sales where they would blow out trades of Marvel and DC for like two bucks a piece. And I would buy a hundred of them, you know, with money that we raised. And now it's kind of exploded and I can't keep up with the curation. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what it's come down to. And I get a lot of books just sent to me. Publishers know who I am because I, I do the panels. I, we have their, their artists and even some of their, their, you know, their corporate people that will come on to our panels with us and share their books with us. It's not like go around and say, can I have a free book? I'm a teacher. It's not that easy. You have to, there has to be a return for the publisher when you ask for that. You have to be, you know, hey, this is going to benefit students and it might generate sales because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it a summer reading choice or I'm going to buy a set for my classroom or, you know, kids will buy volume. I get volume one from you. They'll buy volume two, three, four because they want to keep reading it. So, yeah, that's a really important dimension. Very important dimension. So. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned clubs because one of the most common I get at my store is someone bringing the manga club or someone bringing the comics club or the art club or whatever to go shopping with their teacher. Uh, and that's a great way to start is asking the students, where should I start? Because they probably know already actually what they want to read. They're, re they're ready to go. <laughs> I will say too that um, for those of us uh, teachers who are really budget limited, which is most teachers, um, I have built a pretty amazing collection just by putting the word out that I was looking for comics. Um, Cause I'm friends with a lot of great nerds and a lot of those great nerds wish that there had been a comics collection at their school. Mm -hmm. So when my friends hear that, Oh, Nora's teaching a lot more comics nowadays, they will, they've gone into their basements and onto their shelves and pulled stuff that sometimes it's hard for them to part with. And they, they, they hand it to me like they're giving me a, a, a child. Um, but they want those in the hands of students. And so they're willing to donate um, their own copies or their duplicates. I mean, a lot of comics nerds have doubles already. I have obtained so many great books for my students just from the generosity of my friends. Yeah, that's been a resource for me as well, putting it out on Facebook. Um, I work a lot with, like I said, Comic Cons locally too. So I meet a lot of cosplayers and collectors and fans. Um, and the same thing is true. You know, I send that message out on Facebook. Anybody got any graphic novels they don't want? And people yeah. will donate. And it's, it's pretty heartwarming, you know, that they know that they don't read it anymore. Some kid will. And that's a good thing. I would also say, I think part of this question is not just where do we actually get comics from, but comics we get, right? Uh, how do we start in terms of selection? And I think it's really important to remember that Comics is not a monolith, that you can start with whatever topic, whatever curriculum area, whatever theme, the hero's journey or anything else, and start by Googling or asking your local public librarian or your local retailer, you know, what comics do you have about environmentalism? Or what comics do you have about 
the American Constitution or what comic, you know, and there are comments about these things. Uh, and so you can start wherever you already are um, in whatever reading you want. It's doing whatever reading you are teaching, uh, whatever topics you're teaching. There's probably a graphic novel. About it. We'll start there. That's awesome. Yeah. Y'all, these, y'all are great. <laughs> Y'all just are, yeah. Um, so uh, I want to move on to um, to talk a little bit about, uh, we've talked about how to, uh, where to start possibly and why we'd want to, but also I want us to focus on the fact that even though um, comics curriculum and graphic novels are Again, they're where it's at, as we've, as we've stated. They're becoming more and more popular in classrooms. Um, however, on the flip side of that, uh, many of these works continue to be uh, challenged and banned. And educator, educators and librarians um, who want to include comic books um, may face challenges. And Nora, you actually have experience with this. Um, so... <laughs> So could you tell us a little bit about your experience? Um, so you were you were in the front lines of the Chicago Public Schools attempt to ban um, Persephone in 2013. And just tell us a little bit about that experience. So um, that all started when I got a text from a former colleague because I had switched schools a few years before within the Chicago Public School System. Um, a former colleague, when I left that school, I gave her my class set of Persepolis because she was going to be taking over the class in which it was taught. So I said, here, here are my books that I bought with some grant money, but I want you to keep them and teach them. Um, she texted me that they had been pulled from her classroom and they were taking copies from the library and the system was going to ban the book, the entire Chicago public school system. I had been teaching already for 15 years at that point, and I had never seen an attempt at a system-wide ban of anything. Um, as briefly as I can possibly put it, it sounded like somebody with connections flipped open Persepolis and saw one panel that they found objectionable. Uh, we refer to it now as the vaguely drawn penis. I used to know the page number by heart. It might be page 54, but I'm a little rusty. Um, and freaked out and called all the right people and things moved I, as, as they do when ignorance is governing a decision-making process, things moved way faster than they should. And all of a sudden there was a top-down order to remove all copies from classrooms and school libraries. So fast forward to how we addressed it. Well, first off, we started being very loud about it. There was a protest at that school. There was a protest down at the Board of Ed, but librarians, man, librarians are superheroes. Um, first of all, they immediately pointed out that you cannot pull a title from a school library. A principal cannot decide to pull a book from a school library. That has been covered by the Supreme Court. Uh, so those copies were safe. Curriculum copies, that is an administrative decision. And so they were vulnerable. So the secret that we did at my school, I'm going to let you in on a secret, how to protect a book when someone's trying to ban it, make it a library copy. We took all of our classroom copies because we had a librarian that was not about to let a book get banned. She recataloged all of our school copies as library copies and then checked them all out to me. So that in case, because the word was the Chicago public schools were going to show up at schools and literally physically take these books. I'm telling you, this was two of the weirdest days I've ever had as a teacher. Um, like there yeah. were going to be people marching into our school to take these books. So we wanted to make sure that they were um, sheltered in the library and also physically unavailable to be removed anyway. So that was what we did. And all we were trying to do was buy time for everyone to get their sanity back. And there was some good media coverage of it. I would say anytime someone challenges any kind of book, involve the media, be as loud as you can, involve parents, community organizations. Um, the author, Marjan Satrapi, heard about this and was like talking about it from Paris as like, what? And she also made the point, she's like, Chicago, really? Um, so by the time it really, and I mean, it made the news all over the world um, that Chicago was trying to ban this comic book. So by the time everybody kind of gathered their wits and realized how it looked um the like the books were safe and and we had kind of discovered a secret way to hide books i hope that answers your question oh, that's great that's as briefly as i can explain two or three very weird days in chicago in march of 2013 and you can find that story uh in a couple of places online because it did it did really get a lot of attention because it happened so fast and it was so uh out of left field and unjustified. Mm -hmm. um, so having a book 
or a program also, I mean, it could be physically taking a book out um, and in just having even like uh, having a program can sometimes be challenged as well. Um, that can be a scary experience, especially if you're an educator and, and you want to keep your job. Um, but we want uh, educators and librarians to know that they're not alone. Um, so just to build on on what Nora was saying, you're talking about reaching out. Uh, who who all like obviously CBLDF? We are a resource that you can reach out to. We uh, that's what we're here for. Um, and we have again on our website. Um, a large just array of resources that are available to you. Um, contact me personally if you are, uh, or Charles, if you are um, experiencing a challenge. Um, but what are some other organizations you, you mentioned? Um, media, did you, did, did you reach out to any other organizations um, or resources to help um, with that fight? So I do have to say, now that I think about it, that's when I learned about the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund which mm -hmm. has been my organizational superhero group ever <laughs> since. Like I, I was, again, I didn't come from the comics world. So like, this was all new to me. And the fact that there was an organization that existed just to protect comic books, like that was awesome. Um, I reached, I was approached by the, um, uh, the School of the Art Institute um, and some really great folks that advocate for comics there and, a, and another um, like, um, college program for comics as well uh they were here for the fight and and also I, I i mentioned our school library and that's how i first came across the fact that the american library association has someone assigned just to help you with book challenges mm -hmm. like man career goals i want to be the student <laughs> like just protect books all the time so that's another great organization the ala is here for that fight too mm -hmm. So um, in addition to um, to being challenged from uh, outside sources, um, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about where to, to begin with developing a comics uh, collection for your classroom. But, you know, this uh, educators face financial challenges uh, in developing um, developing their their collections. And again, like we, we kind of touched on that a little bit when we talked about uh, where to start. But I would like to talk a little bit more about that. And Andrew, I know that you, again, work hand in hand with, with educators. Uh, do you have some, uh, could you add to that uh, to provide some advice for navigating financial challenges? Uh, sure, I hope I can. Uh, I think the, I think we've already heard a lot of great suggestions and, and um, soliciting donations, letting people know you're in the market for comics is a great way to start for sure. Um, I think knowing that if you are playing a long game and you are starting with a very small amount of money, you can still build a really great collection is an important thing. You don't need $2,000 today. You can start with $40 and $40 next term. And as if you are being intentional uh, and consistent, you can build an awesome collection. And it, w it will emerge faster than you think. Um, so I, that's the first thing. I don't get discouraged. But also, every time you add a bit to your collection, uh, you will hopefully see positive results that then become your ammunition, right? So you want to keep track of how read and loved these books are or how curriculum relevant they are. Um, and the more you get, the more ammunition you have. So I would say that you can get into that cycle. And again, you can start with a small, you know, I got four books, they were, you know, super relevant to what we were talking about in class. You know, all these kids read them. And I can tell you that next term to advocate for getting another four books. Like, that, start small, I guess, is my, my main advice. Mm -hmm. um, and also, know that many retailers want your long-term business. So you don't have to pay full retail price. If you're, if you're buying for an educational purpose, any retailer that's thinking about the matter for any <laughs> length of time should be giving you a discount. They should want you to come back. They should be finding you a deal or like finding you the remaindered copy that's you know only five bucks when it started out as 30. Um, so I would say, again, reach out to your retailers um, and say, look, what can you do for me? Um, because I know for me, I have a comic book shop and I want you to be my customer for the next 15 years. And I'm gonna try and start that off really well by wowing you with the deals that I can find the first time. So that's another option. Can, I, I, add that, two, yeah, can I add two quick things to that? Yeah. Um, 
one of the ways that I got money to buy comics for our library collection was our school has a mini grant program where like money that's raised through fundraising arms kind of, there is a little pool for small needs, registration fees, event fees. I applied just for a small grant of like 250, 300 bucks to buy comic books to just like start the seed of a library collection. And when I went to one of my favorite local comic shops and I was like, Hey, I have 300 bucks to spend. Will you help me spend it on a good start to a collection? It was awesome. And I got way more than 250 or $300 worth of comics because of exactly what he just said, as far as like building, you know, building that base. And as far as an idea for teachers, one of the things I do when I teach comics is I send my kids out into the field. They have to go on an independent comic shop field trip. That's one of the assignments for my comics unit is I give them a list of local comic shops and we, we search online. You know, there's a website for comic shops near me, like find your local comic shop. Um, and I tell them about the ones I've been in and kind of the different vibes they have and uh, where they might want to go for if they're looking for more zines, whatever. But they, I am, their assignment is they have to document their trip. I need a selfie of them with a comic shop employee with some books in the background, like because I know what these <laughs> shops look like no cheating. Uh, and then there's a Google form they have to answer about like, um, when did you go? Was it what you expected? What did you see? Did you buy anything? Like, did you have any conversations? So I encourage them to not just set foot in the comic shop, but interact with the comic shop and maybe try to soak up a little bit of comic shop culture. And I've found that if you give them enough time and you give them a good start on where they might go, this is a really great assignment to um, kind of encourage kids to see the other books that are out there that you might not have. I would also say- And to teach social skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> to build on all of this, I would also say, make it a defined yeah. project to add comics to your classroom library. I think that um, <laughs> sort of the idea that you want to maybe add some graphic novels and you're gonna hope you find 50 bucks to do that with or whatever, make it a project, name it. There's lots of scholarship about the pedagogical value of comics, about visual literacy being a thing that you need to teach. Like if you can find, you know, all these resources, but you're more likely to convince someone to give you money if you accept a defined thing. Say, hey, look, I wanna introduce, I wanna get people reading these for the specific reason. Over this period of time, I need this many books and it's a project that has like defined edges not it's not simply like for on the one hand i realize i'm contradicting myself here on the one hand yes play a long game where over the next 10 years you're going to gradually accrue stuff but for now call it a small game and say look if i only had 10 books like this i could do this defined thing this month uh, and start there mm -hmm. and, and build edges around it to, to make it an articulatable problem. There's also, um, I, I think um, Nora brought it up, there's grants, local grants you can usually apply for and get a couple of hundred dollars here and there. Uh, comics are very expensive. They are by and large more expensive than buying a paperback copy of, you know, Huckleberry Finn or something. Buying the manga classic version of it is going to cost you more. Um, but there is an intrinsic value in having that version of the book in your library. So um, there are a lot of uh, local art grants that you can usually pick up um, that will help you fund, you know, that if you have, like, as Andrew pointed out, a, a very specific purpose, a very specific uh, task or project that you want to build it around. Um, these grants can also be helpful to bring artists to your classroom. So you buy the book that the artist produced and then the artist comes to your classroom and helps you teach the book. Um, I've been pretty fortunate in that I've had support from my administration and my department chair. So I've managed to get a couple of class sets, um, you know, each year. So I've got several now. Um, but as far as the, libraries, the library goes, um, I find that the fundraising, also crowdfunding, um, Donors Choose is a good place to go. If you're not asking for $2,000, you asking for $300 to buy, you know, 30 titles or something or 40 titles of something, that's, that's another option as well. Um, if you don't go to that well too often, anyway. And see if your local retailer will run a graphic novel book fair at your school, the fundraiser. Mm -hmm. uh, Scholastic does one, they provide a kit for it too. So. Mm -hmm. 
and your local comic book shop can can likely do that. Set you up with stuff. Kids can shop, and they'll kick back a percentage as a credit for you to purchase comic stuff. Yeah, definitely. It's a good one. Well, I want to thank you all. So we we have gone through our um, all of our questions, and you have provided wonderful, valuable information. I'm going to open it up now for Q and A. Um, so attendees, if you scroll your uh, mouse at the bottom of your screen, you should see um, a panel of a menu, and you can click on Q and A, and then type your questions in there, and we will answer them for you. We may not have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll just hold up my brand new trade of Ironheart that I just got that I'm really excited about. It's beautiful. Oh, when, did that <laughs> drop? Did that drop this week? Um, it actually came out a couple of weeks ago, and the first two comic shops I went to, because I'm going to say this again if it hasn't been said loud enough, I get my comics from comic shops. I do not get my comics from Amazon. Um, I, I buy it from a place right by me. And the first two were sold out. So I'm in Chicago, which is where eViewing is from, and she's actually an alum of the school where I teach. So we love eViewing, and we're so excited that this trade came out. So you go chase yourself down a copy of the first trade of Ironheart because it's. Really I'm gonna cool. as soon as we're done. That's where I'm going. Going to my comic shop. Okay, to buy so it. we we have a we have several questions. We have four anyway. Okay. So we will we'll start with the first one. The first one is from Nicole. Nicole asks, "What comics would you recommend to start off a middle school library?" Ooh, there's so many. Bone. <laughs> uh, Bone amulet. Phone. Little... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, my my just turned nine year old who is a reluctant reader and and like is doing some catch up on his reading abilities really loved the bone series and then they can graduate right from bone to amulet those are some good like more elementary than middle school like that's like third fourth grade but also i mean reluctant readers in fourth and fifth those are good mm. um well, i've got a couple um i mean we mentioned roller girl already um this is the other book by victoria jameson called all's fair um then the Kristen Gutsnuck's uh, most recent book, Making Friends, Back to the Drawing Board. This is a sequel to Making Friends number one. Um, there's a great series called Red's Planet that doesn't get a lot of play, and I think it's worth uh, your time. Um, oh my God, middle school. Uh, First Second has an entire line of middle school books, so does Scholastic, um, that you can go onto their websites and look at, at some of the books they have. Um, I'm going to pull up a picture on my phone here of my library and I'm going to come up with a bunch more titles if Andrew wants to jump in and I'll, okay. I'll come back. Also, I'm in my 13 year old's room. So while Andrew talks, I'm going to run over to his bookshelf and see what his last favorite is. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> I know I, uh, I gave a list that had some starter suggestions that uh, you all will get via email after this session. But the first on the list is um, the book by Svetlana Shmokova. Um, Awkward is the first one, Brave yeah. is the second, and Crush is the third. These are exactly for the fans of books, like things like Raina Telgemeier's books. They're in that middle school social world. Um, they're complex. They're more complex than you think they're going to be. They, even as an adult reading them, um, they have a lot to offer. Um, and there's no content that is on the edge of any, like, there's, they are, entirely like 100% core perfect items for you to get for a middle school library for sure. Yeah. Svetlana yeah. Shmakova. Definitely. She's great. Um, and Vera Brogsall, Anya's yeah. Ghost and Be Prepared. Um, and Nidhi Chanani, she's a good friend. Pashmina was an amazing debut middle school book for her. Um, the Mighty Jack series, Z to the Space Girl series. Yes. Uh, we've talked about Amulet. Let's see what else I got here. Uh, March. Uh, did, did we mention March while I was gone? No, we didn't. Oh. March by John Lewis and Andrew Iden and yeah. uh, Nate, Nate Powell. Powell. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Phoebe and so her I unicorn, too. Shelf. Yeah. yeah, Phoebe and her unicorn mm -hmm. um, by uh, Dana Simpson. <laughs> Such a great series. So funny um, and cute and middle schooly. The Sunny series, Sunny Side Up and Swing It Sunny um, by the Holmes. Uh, I mean, if, you, if you're not worried about 
LGBTQ representation. There's a lot of great middle school area books if you're not in, an, in a school where you might get in trouble for having stuff like that. Um, the Witch Boy and um, The Prince and the Dressmaker, mm -hmm. which is actually one of my all-time favorite books yeah. ever, ever, ever. Uh, and I spinning. just got that the other day myself. I'm, that's next on my reading list. I'm so oh, excited about it. So good. <laughs> so good. And if you don't cry at the end of it, you're not a human being. Um, <laughs> and you have to remember, there's so much manga, too. There's so much yeah. manga. That is yeah. It's it, it tough to navigate sometimes, but My Hero Academia would be a great option. Uh, I would work in most middle schools. Some middle schools find it on, a bit on the edge, but... Uh, It'll, it'll be like coffee. You can get it. Yeah. And My Brother's Husband. Yes. But volumes one and two. I cried like four times reading volume two. What an amazing book that is, manga. Again, LGBTQ issues there as well. So The one that got me, so now that we're just talking about comics that make us cry, I kill giants. <laughs> like if oh you my read God. I kill giants, you don't just like come apart yeah. as a human. Um, yeah. Here's some quick ones I found on my son's shelf that are very well read. Cardboard. Oh, yeah. So good. Uh, I already held up Apocalypse Taco. I just picked that up at my local shop the other day. And my son really likes Godzilla comics. Gotcha. We have a lot of Godzilla comics. So if you're, if you're raising a little like horror adjacent weirdo like I am, the Godzilla <laughs> comics are really good. Yeah. I, don't, oh, I don't want us to run out of time though. We have more questions, right? Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. We have a few more questions. Right. Um, so any resources you suggest specifically for college librarians, especially those supporting a college education? Oh, resources, um, CBDLF, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, I would take a look at the Eisner um, and the uh, Excellence in Graphic Literature Awards. They're two different book awards. There's an adult category that you can look at and see the nominees and the winners on both of those. The Ignats as well, which is SPX's awards, Small Press Expo where you can get uh, a line on some of the best annual um, uh, you know, books that are uh, kind of targeting adult readers. Uh, but you can study middle school and high school level books at the college level as well. Like you can incorporate them in um, just as easily. So some of the same resources that I think um, Nora has already uh, compiled uh, can, can get you there as well. Yeah, I would say faculty of education is that people use to build their elementary and middle high school collections. Um, and perhaps to do it with an eye, you know, you don't want to carry a whole run of Naruto in your faculty of education library, perhaps. But maybe you want some representative samples. That would start with actually the uh, elementary and middle school lists that are floating around. Um, so we have our next question, let's see, is, have you had any luck showing how graphic novels engage struggling readers or EEL students? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, and that's not just at school where you will find a lot of students either because of skill deficits or language barriers or even just a block. Like there are some kids that if school tells them to read a book, they're not going to read that book. Um, I've found that comics and graphic novels are great for that, but on a more personal level, my younger son, I mentioned he was doing some catching up on his reading. We didn't find out till he was almost seven that he was legally blind in one eye. Wow. And uh, he had had a really hard time. He had, yeah, he had dodged all of his vision tests at school, um, but we, he had had a really hard time learning to read because he really just was working from one eye. And that was not just the first thing I thought of, but also his vision therapist said comics. Start with comics because they're less intimidating. They're going to give his, you know, his vision a chance to kind of play catch up. So it's funny. I've been teaching comics for almost 20 years, but in the last year and a half, it has made a huge difference for one of my sons. And now he's above grade level. Not that I put that much stock in stuff like that, but he also loves to read. Like I said, he just finished the Bone series and and is was so excited to get more graphic novels for his birthday last week. Like I got all feelingsy about it. So that's where I'm coming from, both the school and the home perspective. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree with. Um, I have. I have. Again, children are different. My daughters are. are, are obsessive reader. My son was very reluctant. Graphic novels um, certainly engaged him and, and helped him. Um, and then as an educator, I found, um, especially for English learner um, 
English language learners that comics are so great because they provide a visual, just like if I was going to be learning another language, which I but I barely speak English very well. Um, but yeah, like it, it, it gives students a visual to the written language and it gives them cues and helps them um, and gives them confidence as they read. Yeah. And last question. Can you suggest any comics in other languages or ones with additions in multiple languages? Hmm. Well, Phoebe and her unicorn is translated into like five or six different languages now. Um, a lot of the bigger ones have been. Um, I know Smile has been translated, and you know most of Raina's books have. Um, I can't say that I'm an expert though in this area, so uh, maybe Andrew. This is, <laughs> this is something I've actually heard from teachers in language departments at my school about. Um, like the French teachers teach Persepolis in the original French, and when the Chinese teacher heard that that was happening, wanted to find comics that were originally published uh, in Chinese. So I would. Um, those you have to go to the internet for a lot, but I'll let Andrew speak to that. I just know that we have had more of a challenge tracking those down, but they're out there. Mm. Absolutely, there are hugely rich comics traditions in other language communities, and many things that we have in English are translated uh, into other languages and vice versa. The biggest barrier um, buying these things in Anglophone North America is distribution. But there isn't someone on the ground distributing these uh, to retailers and thus to consumers. Um, so for Spanish, the situation isn't too bad, especially in the States. For example, Scholastic publishes their own Spanish editions of many of their books. They translate them and they publish them. Any retailer should be able to, who carries English language copies should be able to order you Spanish language ones. In Canada, probably not in the States, Scholastic does the same for their French editions. So if you needed a French copy of Brana Telgemeier's Smile, it comes from the English language publisher, you just order the French version. Other than that, you are looking at actually like one at a time importing overseas pretty much. Um, and at large cities, uh, you just need to seek out that language community bookstore, um, hopefully that might exist, uh, and see what they can do for you. Because even if they don't carry those books in stock, if they have the relationships with the publishers already, that's the largest part of the battle. Um, so go find your Farsi bookstore or your Mandarin bookstore in whatever closest to your city and uh, see if they can bring some catalogs out and you can find the stuff you need. Wonderful. All right. Well, we are, we have come to the end. This is perfect. It's fun. I do want to give, um, again, y'all um, a, a last chance to also tell us about any projects or things you're involved with that you would like um, attendees to take away. I know, Michael, you were talking about, you are part of Lit X. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. My Twitter is at trying teacher, T R Y I N G teacher. Um, and I post a lot of stuff. It's all, there's no politics at all there. I, I made it my non politic place in social media. It's all education. So you can follow me, and um, there's a lot of, I post a lot of stuff about comics in the class, especially when school's starting up in a couple of weeks. And then at uh, we are lit X L I T X, which is um, my educational cohort of teachers that teach all sorts of not just comics but lit X means X is a variable. So a text can be a movie, it can be a song, it can be a comic book, um, you know, it could be a piece of art. So the idea is like diversifying what we consider a text. So that's what I do. And just look for me at the big shows. Uh, probably be in Chicago and Seattle. Uh, at those two venues doing panels at those places. Are y'all going to be anywhere soon that you would like <laughs> to tell panelists about? <laughs> Are you going back to school and teaching uh, 150 new <laughs> names in a couple of weeks. That's where I'm going to be. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> uh, and for my part, I'm looking forward to the Toronto Comic Arts Festival 2020, which happens in May. If anyone's going to be in Toronto or wants a fun comics thing to do, please come on up. We whole, have a whole day of programming for teachers and librarians on May 8th, 2020. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us and thank you attendees for joining. You will receive a post webinar survey. Please fill that out. It takes like maybe three minutes. Um, and again, be looking for those takeaways. I will send those to you in your email boxes. And I hope everyone
everyone has a beautiful day. Thank you all for so much for your time. And I and good luck going back to school and work. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.